Well, I'm not, like you said, I'm William Slayton. My wife is, is Becky. She's back here. Uh, we live in Hopkins County, can, over uh, near Madisonville. We're just south of Madisonville. If, if you know where Evansville, Indiana is, it's 60 miles due south of Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Rocky Bluff Farm is our farm name uh, because we have three bluffs. You see the picture. This morning we had some heavy rains, and our bluffs were rolling this morning. Uh, but what we do, you see my children up here. That's Dean and Lauren. Dean was with us on Tuesday, but he decided to stay home today. He didn't want to ride in the car as far. Uh, I work a full-time job, public job. I'm, uh, I'm not able, or, it, or I wasn't able when I started. I'm, I'm getting close, being able to make a living off the farm. But so what we decided to do, I grew up on the farm. But after I come home from work, I still had all kinds of chores, farm chores I needed to do. So just took the kids with me. And, you know, my wife, she doesn't work. Public job. She's the full-time farmer. And we just made a decision. We were going to take the kids with us. And that's and we just made we just decided to make it a family event as we worked our farm. Uh, this is an aerial photo of our farm. Uh, it's a it's a small this is our home farm. We have some rental places. This is uh right at about 120, 130 acres. Uh when I was young, we had cattle on our farm. Uh, this is where I grew up. But my dad's primary thing was hog farming. And all of the tillable ground on the farm was in cornfields for our hogs. And uh, we had maybe 30, I mean 18 or 19 cows on 30 acres. Uh, at the time, it may not, and they were, I'm talking small Angus cows, uh, uh, 600 pounds, 700 pound cow. I'm talking about way back in the 70s and, and uh, at the time. Cows were an afterthought. My dad, he just wanted the cows to keep the place sort of clean. It wasn't a primary focus until after the 90s. The hog prices in the 90s put us out of business. And at that point in time, I was getting older, and we started focusing more on, on our cattle. This is a, uh, my wife put these slides together. And uh, so I, yesterday, Tuesday, I was uh, learning the slides as I was showing them. So <laughs> here's, a, here's a picture of, of my, uh, it's a, it's sort of a dated picture. My son Dean now is uh, 14, getting ready to turn 15 this month, and my daughter's 12. Uh, this this is a little bit dated picture, but it's the best one that that she wanted to put in there. My son, he's at the age he is really starting to help out. Uh, my daughter, she is at the age she's really starting to make pets, or trying to make pets, and I'll get I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, she takes that after her mother. Uh, this is my father, uh, and this is one of his first registered Angus bulls, and he made a pet out of him. I guess it just uh, comes by natural in my family, but when we decided to start focusing on cows, Dad wanted to get uh, Angus. We had, old, we had Angus in the past, and he wanted to to start improving our genetics with registered Angus. So he found some seed stuff, registered Angus herds and he started buying heifers and bulls. And uh, this is a, a picture of him and his first bull, his first registered Angus bull. So this is where we started. This is where we are beginning when we started trying to improve our cow herd. My dad was a full-blooded Angus guy. He didn't want anything to do with any other breed. I'm not, I tried convincing him and tried to convince him, after, especially after, after I went to college, uh, about hybrid vigor. And, you know, we're leaving, we're leaving opportunities on the table 
by being straight full bred if we're not going to be selling registered stock. So, with upon convincing, I convinced him to let us start trying to do some crossbreeding. Uh, and we, up on studying different breeds, I, we decided that using Simmental was the best option for us. Uh, we were looking to build uh, F1 Sam Angus cows. F1 is, a, is a, the first cross, 50-50 Angus Simmental cross. And this is uh, some of our first three herd sires that uh, we had uh, first introduced on the farm that wasn't Angus. Our goals when we started this breeding process, we wanted to in increase our cow uh, longevity and docility. Uh, let me hit on that just a little bit. Docility is our number one criteria. Uh, you see my daughter there. This is one of her pets. I think this cow's name was Rachel. And uh, Rachel got where she couldn't produce anymore, so she just was a retired pet. <laughs> so uh, I, we, we will call, even to this day, we will call a cow quicker over docility than anything. Um, I don't. She can be my top cow in the herd. If she, as a gentleman said Tuesday, if she has her screws comes loose, she's got to go. Uh, Dr. Anderson, we worked quite a bit with Dr. Anderson over the years with uh, UK Extension, and he has a, a quote that I picked up like really well. He said... Uh, some of the best things you can give these cows is some trailer mice. Put them on a the trailer, take them to town. So, uh, and we wanted to, our goal, we wanted to increase our weaning weights. Coming from, now we had made gradual improvements by with our registered stock. But when I was young, if we could get a 350, 400 pound calf to take to the, take to the market, we were doing good. I mean, that's just where we were. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to I wanted to increase our weaning weights because that's what it's all about. If you don't have the pounds to sell, you're not going to be. That's that's when you're in cow calf business. That's what you're selling is pounds. And in a way to do that, we wanted to increase our milk production. Okay, the ways we implement the things we did to implement bringing more dollars to our farm was one, we improved our genetics. We improved our pasture ma management. Uh, I learned in college, as I was exposed to it, about this intensified rotational grazing in the uh, early 90s. I, I grew up on a farm. We had a perimeter fence, and that was it. The cows went wherever they wanted. We had a pasture up in front of the house, and that's how Dad checked the cows, because every day they would make their round in front of the house. And uh, so we started working on our pasture management and how we handle that and improve our health program. When I was young, it was a big day just to get the cows up and deworm them one time a year. Uh, we focused on marketing. Uh, first and foremost is selling our calves through CPH, uh, certified preconditioning. I mean, do some of that work to get your cattle ready to go to the next stage and pick up on some of that premium. We started selling freezer beef to individuals by the cat, halves, quarters, and holes. Uh, we participated in some of the UK sanctioned bred heifer sales. Uh, we've even used our cows for embryo recipients. We've had our Sim Angus cows have full-blooded Gelby calves. Uh, and that's a pretty unique situation there. And uh, just a couple years ago, three years ago, I believe it is, we started selling uh, beef out of the freezer through our business. We named it Rooster's Beef. Rooster's Beef, we've had, I, you wouldn't believe the number of questions people have asked us, how do you get beef from a chicken? <laughs> and I... And uh, I have to tell them that Rooster was my father's nickname. 
And uh, right when we were starting planning this business, my father was diagnosed with leukemia, and it was fast-growing leukemia. And, uh, and long story short, he died about three weeks later after he was diagnosed. And we hadn't even decided to name what we were going to name it. And my sister and I, she's a, she's a part of this business, and my wife, we decided to name it after our father in honor of him. So that's how we come up with Rooster's Beef. So uh, it's, it's trial and error. You know, it's finding what works for you and your farm and your management capabilities of what you can do on your farm. And uh, we've, we've tried a little bit of everything. Uh, rotational grazing. The key to rotational grazing, which I'm, you've heard a lot about today, is the big thing I was after. I was, we were able to increase the total pounds of utilized forage per acre, less waste. Uh, do that by redu we reduced our selective grazing. And the key is you got to give that grass a break. After they've grazed it, you've got to give it some rest period so it can recover. Uh, I'd rather me just keep saying what you've already heard. You just can't keep driving it down. Uh, the, right now, uh, we have currently on our on our home farm where we live, we got about 100 120 acres of pasture on our homeland, and we have it subdivided in in about 24 to 6 acre paddocks. There are minus, plus or minus. Uh, depending on the time of the year, we move cattle every two to five days. I uh, hadn't got my wife convinced of going out and giving them a little grass every day. It's She's got other things to do. Uh, but we're, we're going to work on that. <laughs> anyway, uh, in the springtime of the year during our breeding season, uh, we choose to uh, divide our cattle herd up into... I didn't say earlier that we started... Uh, it was on a screen, but we use AI very consistently. We uh, synchronize every cow on our farm and time breed her the first day of breeding season. And then we break it out, break them out into about 18 to 22 uh, herd groups. And I like to run one bull per group. Uh, I, I've had some bad experiences of running multiple bulls with a group of cows I had it one time and it taught me. Uh, I had my dominant bull went bad during breeding season and he wouldn't let my least, the lower bull on the totem pole to get the job done, and I had a bunch of open cows. So what we decided to do is break our cow herd up, put a, put a bull with her different groups, and then every 30 days or so, rotate them. And that has really helped out a lot with our, uh, our uh, conception rates. It's just something about it, when you rotate them, it just steers them up, and, and, it, and it helps you get a few more points of uh, conception rate. By us having so many paddocks, we're able to run multiple bulls in different pastures and still do a rotation. We just have to stretch out our days on grass. Now, in each pasture. Now, what we do after we're done with breeding season, we'll combine our herds and that allows us to go into what I call, what a term called mob grazing. That's when we put them in there, they knock it out in a day or two, and then we're moving them out to the next pasture. Uh, the cattle, uh, the cattle learn this system really well. I mean, we, we use a gator to go check our herd, and they hear you coming, they know it's time to be moved. And they'll meet you at the gate ready to go. Uh, and sometimes if, which I don't know why, I mean, sometimes you can use a little bit of feed and that just really gets their attention. But most time that's not necessary. If you got some heifers or something, you're just starting out, a group of heifers, maybe a little feed just in, to, to encourage them to come the way you want them to go. Uh, but it doesn't take long and they're ready to follow you anywhere. Uh, 
we have taken advantage of the soil conservation equip programs uh, in our home county. Uh, the way our pastures are designed, the way we had them designed originally, is all the way to the back of our farm, all the way up to our working pen, we have a roadway slash alleyway. Well, we can pull a cow, put a cow out of any pasture, put her in the, the up roadway, and take her all the way to our working pens. And uh, this over here to the right, well, let me get this clicker to work here. Oh, right here, just picture just opening gates and the cows are just willingly coming into the next pasture. Right through here uh, is up and down some gradual hills and it's just paths and we had paths worn out there and it was starting to wash a little bit and the conservation service says we could help with that we will help you install uh, animal trail walkway uh, they called me out two or three times and I called it a road I said it's not a road it's an animal trail walkway and what this is uh, this a lot this right here is about 1,100 feet, I think, is what it measures out. This gravel walkway up and down some hills. And it allows our cows to travel, and it, it, it takes care of the, the erosion. There's no erosion as we're, as you see on this bottom picture right here. I've got paddocks on both sides. Uh, this is another picture of the cattle. We're actually taking them to the working corral right there. We got them in the alleyway. And if you can look real close, me and this clicker, uh, all I have is one strand electric fence. That's if, if uh, that's all my dad had. And you know, the name of the game is, make, is, is trying to be profitable. Uh, a lot of this fencing was made available through Equip. But if our cattle would not handle in this, they didn't stay. It's just point and simple. They're, they were going to be gentle enough to handle them the way we want them to be handled. Or if they wanted to be a fence jumper, they were going to be jump right on the trailer when the trailer when they got close to it. Uh, spring growth. Let me talk a little bit about our, our calving season. We try to calve in January, February. Uh, the Two points for that, two main points, there's three main points. Uh, one is our calves are big enough to take advantage to help of the spring flush right here. Here's a picture of my kids hiding into, in some tall grass. Uh, second thing is we're breeding cows back in April, April, early May. And it's a, I found it's a lot easier to breed cattle when it's cooler than it is wait for, for it to get hot. And then, of course, we're using a lot of fescue, 31, and you start dealing with that endophyte factor as well. But we, by the time it gets, gets hot late May, I'm hoping all my cows are bred and my breeding season's over. Uh, like I said, we make it a family event. Our, our uh, children go out with us. Well, this is our dog, Lucy. She thinks she's one of the family. She has to go, too. So, all right, stockpiling fescue. Uh, this is something that that is really good. We try to take advantage of. Uh, there, I know the gentleman before, he said that in his program, fertilizer is not what he uses. But in my program, I do. And I understand his market, he doesn't need to. And I'm not saying anything negative about that at all. But when it comes to stockpiling fescue, applying fertilizer makes all the difference in the world. But you gotta have the moisture and to go with it. Uh, here's a picture, I can't see the picture, I don't know if you can or not. <laughs> Sorry to say, but this is a real lush pasture that, you know, that has been fertilized, the moisture came, I was able to get it on there, it activated, and this is some pasture right here of this, where I, we didn't get the moisture, I didn't feel like it was 
timely manner to, to apply fertilizer, and you can see the difference. It just, it's a huge difference at what it is on our farm anyway. At least, at least. Okay. Uh, the way we manage our stockpile is in August, end of August, 1st September, we pull all our cattle off pasture, and we put them in what I, we call, to in our personal terminology, we call it our winter pasture. It's our paddock that's closest to our hay barn. And it's, it's more or less our sacrifice field, our dry lot, and we're trying to re allow the rest of the entire farm to stockpile. Uh, reason we do this is because at this same period of time, we're getting ready to wean our calves. So when we pull these calves off these cows, our cows' nutritional requirements drops tremendously. The amount of nutrition she needs to maintain her body condition is at her lowest in her yearly cycle. So that is the time we're choosing to feed her our lowest quality hay. And two, it's not muddy. And and we're getting and we're allowing our best quality uh, feed, feed source, which is our stockpile, to accumulate. And uh, this is, wait a minute, I didn't hit the wrong button. Okay. So what we do is we keep these cows in this dry lot. Uh, we were all, this is some pictures from how we managed when we were all spring or winter calving. Uh, we're now branching into some fall calving. Do for my rooster, our rooster's beef business, we need our a, a more equal supply of calves on both ends of the year to help us with that business. Uh, but that's what we do. We leave our cows on this and feed them hay until they calf. And this is a picture of my daughter. Oh, hit the wrong button. A picture of my daughter with help helping a baby calf. Now what we do when a cow calves. She's in a small pack, I think it's about eight acres, I've got all my cows in. It's a relatively small field. When the cow calves, I have this trailer rigged up, we pull it behind the gator, and we go out in the field and we get, get the calf, pull it up in the trailer, and the way we do, is, do it, we use a catch hook. We don't actually go out and just grab the calf. We'll use a catch hook, grab it by its leg, ease it up in the trailer. It doesn't feel threatened, Therefore, it doesn't cry or any of that very rarely, and mama doesn't get excited. But even still, we can get inside this trailer, we can tag it, what band it. We, I like to use bands early on, uh, newborns if I'm going to do it. And uh, I check the calf's health condition, make sure it's sucked, and so on. We will then move the calf and cow to our stockpile pasture. And as you see, mama will follow baby. All you do is drive the gator, mama will follow the baby. And we'll take it over out in, the, in our stockpile field, open up the gate, let the calf out, mama and baby are in clean pasture. And right about that time, her nutritional requirements for her to maintain is going way up. So therefore, we're giving her, we're moving her to our best feed supply. Rather than and rather than just leaving her on on our lower quality hay, and there's a picture of our kids. They want to ride too. They don't want just the calves to ride. Uh, by doing this, because when I first first year to a stockpile fescue, just like uh, the gentleman said, I had dry cows. I done pulled the calves off of them out there eating my lush stockpile. And about the time they're ready to start calving, it's all gone. Now I'm putting them in a, now I'm having to pull them and start feeding them hay when their nutritional requirements are at their highest. So we decided to flip flop that. Uh, when we started doing this, we were able to increase our livability substantially. Uh, we used to battle scours and other types of sicknesses on our farms. When we started moving our cal calves to clean pasture and and keeping them on clean pasture, 
the scour, our scour problem, I'm going to say it went all completely away, but it's, it's a fraction of what we dealt with. Uh, it helps us to quickly identify newborn calves. Uh, if there's a calf in the, lot, in the field with the cows, it's a newborn. Let's go get it. Yeah. Or it's usually she identifies it, and when I get home from work, we go get it. But, uh, but now that my son's getting older, I, that may change just a little bit. Uh, another problem we always deal with is mama wants to keep her baby with her. So when she gets ready to eat, she's going to go to hay feeder. She brings her baby with her, and her baby wants to bed down right beside the hay feeder. And we've had multiple calves to get stomped, stepped on in the muck around the hay feeder. When you take them out on the fresh pasture, there's no hay feeder. Mama can keep her baby right beside her as she's eating all around him. Uh, that's okay, I think. And I've had different, different ones, you know, talk about snow. Well, we found if we got six inches of snow or less, the cows, they'll dig around and get it, the pasture. And if you go get a lot more snow cover, you need to put them out of belt. Hey, just got to. Uh, if you go to get much more than, you know, six inches or so. But six inches or less, we don't pay them any attention. They, they can get the grass. Uh, here's just some pictures of our cows and their babies out on, on grass. They're not around a muddy hay ring. They're not in a muddy lot. Uh, here's some pictures of our cows and calves out with, with some snow cover. Uh, there's still no hay or anything. Uh, I mentioned uh, CPH, uh, weaning calves. Uh, in Hopkins County, I'm sure counties up this way, uh, our Farm Bureau was real involved in our county. They've helped fund the money to, to put a chute with scales uh, available to be ran. I think we pay like $25 a day to use a ten or $12,000 chute. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. It'd take a bunch of days' work to, to at $25 a day to pay for a $10,000 chute. Uh, but we, this is our rental farm, and what we do, we wean our calves, we CPH them. And, and another thing this allows us to do by CPHing our calves and, and, and participating, we're able to capture and take advantage of our genetics that we've installed instilled in our herd. We're actually able to capture some of those dollars that of the potential of our calves' ability to grow. And these are just some pictures of us working. Oh, uh, I'm sure you've heard before, but uh, in college, I heard many times, okay, I'll hurry up. Uh, many times, if you can't measure, you can't manage what you can't measure or something it you got to be able to measure it, and that's where scales are really important. Rather than just guessing, if you can measure it, you can identify those cows and uh, cow families that are performing the best on your farm. Because every farm is different, and what works well on one farm may not work well on another. So you want to identify those, those cow families. Uh, another thing we decided to do, if, have any of you seen feed bunks like this? Anybody ever seen those? We've had our fair share of them too, and it's it's just trying to feed cows. And when we and with the with the bucket, if you got if you're trying to feed very many cows, the most dominant cows they're going to push in there and eat all the feed before you can get the rest of them fed. If you're just trying to feed them a few pounds a piece, and that's what we tr what we're trying to do is supplement our uh, younger cows. So what we decided to do is stop spending money on, and on, on this type of stuff. It didn't cost that much more to buy a concrete trough that's there. They're, they can jump in it. They're not going to tear it up. And we decided to, to put feeder, uh, a feeder, a cube feeder, this is a, in, a, in the back of our gator, and we're able to disperse our feed more quickly that way our bottom end cows and our top end cows get a fair chance to eat because we're not feed this is a the pictures of us feeding some cph calves but uh they're not 
when you're feeding cows just of two or three pounds or five or whatever, you've got to get it out fast enough if you're feeding very many. And another thing, rather than is is we decide to you know put rock down around these cat these feed feed troughs that way our cows aren't standing in mud up to their knees, and our gator wouldn't go through it anyway. Uh, I don't know. I got time to talk about our sheep here, but this is my children's project with their sheep. Uh, long story short, I encourage them to stop spending money on toys and start and spend their money and put their money in sheep. Because we had our working pens and our and our corral lots that that were set in vacant most, many many months out of the years, I said, "Won't you put your money in that and let the sheep stay in those pens?" Well, what we found out in the long run is those sheep will keep those pens clean. It's stuff in those pens, those lots that cows won't touch, but those sheep would love them. And my daughter gets to make pets out of them. There's a picture of my wife and so on and so forth. But that, but we sort of stumbled into that thing that works well for us. And the uh, rooster's beef. Uh, we started that just another way to, to try to capture some market share. We had many, many potential quarter, and ha- quarter customers who couldn't handle a quarter. And they was like, well, can you split it down even more? I was like, no, we can't. Our butcher won't allow us. So we decided to get you to go USDA and inspected on some beef, and we can sell it by the pound, by the cut, to potential customers. And uh, there again, we're able to take advantage of our genetics program that we started years and years ago, and, and continually improving. And by doing all these things together, we're learning to keep more dollars trying to control as many of the steps of the cattle business as we can with our own genetics, just like the gentleman spoke earlier, make more money on fewer cows because you're using all the value of those animals. Uh, I guess I got to the end, I guess. (laughs) While we're switching presentations, any questions? Well, thanks for listening.